So thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, in this talk, I'm going to tell you a bit more uh, what CERN is, what CERN does, and uh, how we do monitoring there, and how we recently changed the way uh, the monitoring infrastructure we set up. Um, and in particular, we're going to see how we are now looking and um, introducing some of the SRE uh, practices uh, and the way they improve the way we do monitoring um, uh, and operation. Uh, so a few words about myself. Um, my name is Luca Magnoni. I am a computer engineer. Uh, I study computer science. Um, I work um, on distributed system, writing, developing, and operating so software on many different, uh, let's say, distributed and data intensive application. And um, today I am service manager and the project ar architect in the CERN IT department. And uh, yes, we do also have an antimatter factory at CERN. That uh, it's sandy if you need antimatter. And uh, <laughs> it, it, it also makes a nice background for picture if you are like science fiction fan like me. Um, so <laughs> moving on the actual talk, I will tell you a bit more uh, what CERN is. Uh, CERN is the European Laboratory for Nuclear Research, has been founded in 1954 by 12 uh, European uh, nations with the idea to put nations together to do science and not do war. Uh, it's today a collaboration of 23 states. Um, it's completely um, founded by member state quota. He has a budget of around $1 billion per year, which if you do the math is around like one cappuccino per a member state citizen per year, which is fairly reasonable deal. Um, the goal of CERN is to do uh, fundamental research. So it merely means to push the boundary of knowledge and to uh, help scientists to give answer to uh, fundamental questions like uh, uh, why there is, some, there is no antimatter in the universe and uh, what was the status of the matter after the, the Big Bang and so, uh, so far. Um, CERN is the world's largest particle physics laboratory. Uh, is located between the border of uh, France and Switzerland. You can see there in the landscape CERN. The actual main location of CERN is here, is in Meran. Um, it's really on the border, like I have my office on the French side, and every morning I cross the street and I go to the Swiss cafeteria. Uh, as Italian, I won't comment on the quality of coffee on both sides, but uh, you know, that's another story. And, and, and apart from this, it's an amazing place. You can see like Mont Blanc in the back, uh, in, in the background of the picture. And um, uh, to do fundamental research, it's basically uh, you need to have a way to observe the reality. You need the same way you need like telescope to look at the star or like microscope to look at cells. You need some very special devices to prove that your theory and your models, they work as expected. And those devices for particle physics research are namely particle accelerator and um, particle detector. And what you see in the yellow and blue line are uh, two of the many uh, particle accelerators that we have at CERN, um, where basically particle are accelerator close to the speed of light and I collided to study the, the fundamental uh, constituents. Um, particle accelerator, uh, the, the LHC, which is the Large Hadron Collider, uh, is our flagship project and is basically a 27 kilo kilometer uh, long uh, uh, accelerator that looks like this. And if you ever wonder, particle accelerator are basically made by uh, huge magnet that are called dipoles, where the beams of protons are uh, accelerated very, very close to the speed of light, like six, nine the speed of light, if you want to call it a nine figure. And then um, they are collide the, the, each other. Um, to, to make those uh, unique is not only uh, the, the largest machine on Earth, you also need uh, quite some uh, um, advanced technology. Mm, to have such magnetic fields, you need very cold condition because uh, to have magnetic fields, you need very, such sort of magnetic fields, you need very strong current circulated uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the magnets around the pipes. And to have uh, those current, you need to have uh, super magnetic uh, condition that are only created when you are very, very close to the absolute zero. 
Uh, you also need uh, the IS vacuum because when you do all this effort to accelerate beams of particles, you really don't want them to collide with some gas atoms uh, around the beams. And eventually what you do, uh, you smash those beams towards a wall or towards, let me say, together to study what happens when new particles are generated. And what you see here is, uh, if you want, uh, a very old uh, pictures, uh, real pictures of what this, uh, this work, how this work was done 60 years ago, if you want. There are really, this is like a, a magnified view of uh, a bubble chamber where particle tracks, when particle crossing some superheated fluids, they will live in tracks and the scientists were studying the tracks to understand what type of particle were generated. And uh, okay, to do the same work today, you don't do any more a visual and a human doing those analyses, but you need to have quite some special machines and that are those things. Those, say, uh, huge uh, devices are a detector. Uh, the two on the top are Atlas and CMS that were uh, designed to um, say study the standard mo model properties and those are the ones that basically confirm the X boson and, uh, and basically um, drove the Nobel Prize in 2012. The one below that are, uh, let's say, other um, experiments that are studying collision of the, uh, the, of the collider are studying uh, are ALICE and uh, SAB. Um, so those detectors are basically gigantic layered uh, sensor in a cylindrical shape uh, that study the tracks that the different particle when they are generated, they travel through the different uh, sensor, uh, let's say technology, and they basically, they can be used to reconstruct the, um, let's say, the different, uh, say, path that the, 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 the particle uh, go for. Uh, you can think of them like some sort of gigantic camera, uh, really like a um, 100 megapixel camera, with the only difference that they take 40 million pictures per second. Um, which, if you want to study all these, it turns out in being something like 1 billion collision and 1 petabyte per second of data. That, if you want to store and process, is well beyond what we can afford. And also because you know already that what you're looking for is very rare event. It's like 10 to the minus 13. So you really want to, to filter out the majority of that data and to just store and care and process what you think it may be interesting. So to do that, um, the different experiments that was the four, the four, let's say, harrow you can see in underground, are actually doing a massive filtering and massing, let's say, um, reduction of the rate, and uh, only the interesting events are actually considered worth um, storing and then, um, say, further analysis. And that is leaving with still um, around several gigabytes per second flow that is then um, going towards the CERN data center, which is what you see in the, in the orange rectangle there, where all this data is actually stored, um, and that is the primary copy of all the LSE data. We have more than 90,000 disks for the OT replicas. Uh, we have more than 50,000 server. All this data is then archived on tapes. We have more than 300 petabytes of data on tapes for the different uh, years of data taking of the experiments. But it's not only there. Um, all this uh, information uh, is then needs to be uh, reprocessed because basically the different tracks need to be placed together and to, be, to create, let's say, events that they can be further analyzed because the idea is that with better understanding, further studying the, 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 let's say, the result, we also refine the theories that are beyond and then we repeat this over and over again for years. And uh, in order to be able, this was, is, is well beyond the CERN computing possibilities alone, um, in the last decades, uh, so-called worldwide LEC computing group has been developed. It's basically a worldwide collaboration where we have more than 170 sites, institutes all around, the, all around the world 
they uh, contribute to the processing and the storage of the data. Um, we have more than, uh, let's say, more than a couple of millions of processing job running every day and more than 10 million transfer of sites between uh, CERN, which is a sort of uh, tier zero of all this data. And then we have a, a number of uh, tier one in a sort of graph structure that they are used for then distribute further around the world the data. And um, all this does not stop in the sense when the data is being used for uh, the main analysis uh, at CERN, it's actually made publicly available and so that uh, also other institutes can profit from the same uh, uh, result to make uh, possibly uh, different research on the same information, on the same basically result that the uh, LSE produced. So that's all for uh, more sir, introductory part. Let's start to look a bit on um, what the CERN ITE is about. Uh, so I thought it would have been interesting to start giving you a bit of uh, early days view, and then I realized it could have been a long, long, long story. And I just dropped here this picture that is basically the one that I found in the archive. is the very first electronic computer installed at CERN. It's in 1958, and it's like um, a vacuum tube computer, really something in, in the very early days. The IT department at CERN, um, it's over 300 people. Uh, the goal is to help laboratory to, the laboratory to fulfill its mission in the sense to provide support uh, for the data center but also for a number of other services that are used to make sure that the, say, all the CERN uh, keeps doing its job. Um, we provide the batch services, we can take care of storage, network, uh, database, web service, so everything that you know, say as um, IT uh, professionals uh, are well aware of. We also provide specific services to experiments, to engineering, but we also provide infrastructure for more administration or infrastructure uh, part. Um, Again, the initial idea is that to have equipment that help doing the analysis that I showed before, those are mainframes in the 70s that are used to do basically to automate the analysis of those uh, bubble chamber, chamber images, if you want, and to something that uh, what it is today. So we moved into more, uh, let's say, standard technology and uh, uh, say industrial standard uh, installations. Mm. <coughs> This picture gives a bit an idea on what happened in the last 10 years uh, in the IT, uh, say the, one of the IT challenges. This is the um, t data taking uh, size in petabytes uh, per month. Uh, but it's interesting here, okay, apart from seeing the overall pictures and seeing that, okay, 2018 it was quite an, uh, quite an year with the accelerator delivering more than 80 petabytes. Um, what Basically, I would like to, you to, to see that everything started in 2009. The accelerators was switched on the first time in 2009. But already there, it was delivering several petabytes, uh, say, per month. And that requires to have a fully working infrastructure was able, that was able to, let's say, work as expected. And that means that the, the actual, let's say, plan in design and setting up the technology uh, needed to to achieve that was we'll start one decade before, around the early 2000. Uh, there already most of the effort was in building a, basically a custom computing fabric uh, that allowed to provide the tool and the technology to manage a data center with thousands of nodes. At that time, most of the, um, the, the say, project were founded by the European uh, founding. And the scale and LAC that was required by LACB, LAC was fairly special. Uh, so basically, most of the effort was in building and designing custom tools that they had to be developed to make sure that, um, say, we could arrive to 2009 um, at that stage. Uh, then in 2013, which is the first uh, basically shutdown of the accelerator because it works in several years of 24-7 data taking, and then there are a couple of years of downtime, uh, we start basically reviewing what we were doing. Uh, we know that the LAC requirement uh, they kept growing. We are now around between round two and three, and uh, yeah, 
the curve up is pretty scary. Is again in the, 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 the volume of the data that needs to be stored. Uh, but in 2013, the CERN scale was no longer special. We knew that there were other companies doing things uh, much bigger than, uh, say, the, the, the CERN need were at the time. And also, we was at the time that we had like the um, productization of things like cloud and cloud computing and cloud management. So we decided to redo the thing. Uh, we decided to change the way we were doing basically IT, and we went for uh, embracing uh, open source technology, open source community, start using tools that uh, allow us to go for uh, mainstream uh, and let's say to do what others were doing so that we could get more from the experience of others. We could contribute to the, to the overall, uh, let's say, community. And we introduce uh, several of those technology like OpenStack, uh, Puppet, or uh, configuration management, or uh, let's say CI and uh, Git and GitLab workflow, and monitoring uh, as well. Uh, bring us to where we are today. Uh, this is one quick overview of uh, the Sun Data Center private OpenStack cloud. We have an uh, OpenStack cloud with more than 300,000 nodes. Uh, we have more than 10,000 different hypervisors, probably 15,000 hypervisors, I think. Um, and we are serving like around uh, 40,000 uh, VMs uh, that are basically the, we, we now virtualize all different resources that are used by all the different services that I mentioned before, so that everything can be, let's say, controlled and optimized. Uh, also the uh, capacity planning can be done in a better way. Um, and again, bring us in 2019, where we are now, again, uh, like in 2013, in another uh, situation of uh, data taking stop, and we are now reviewing what we are doing. We see um, even more tools appearing. We see a lot of uh, movement uh, towards uh, containers and container orchestration technology. They're changing every the way also our users are doing uh, deployment and do expect to do deployment. We are, uh, say, um, looking at some more hybrid workflow to, to, because we know that to scale and to fulfill the needs in the next uh, uh, 10 years, we will need to be able to take the resources where they are, private, but also on, a, on, a, on a, say, more uh, public cloud. And it's here that we are now looking at SRE as a way that we can do to also improve the way we do, uh, say, management of production services uh, and production workflow. So um, we move now into the monitoring part, and that is where I'm basically where I work on. Uh, the monitoring definition at CERN is pretty broad, if you want. Um, monitoring is uh, basically provide monitoring as a service for uh, the CERN data center, for the IT services, and WCG collaboration, which is one of fairly a wide range of, uh, of, of, of let's say, uh, of function of services, which is about dashboarding, alarms, uh, search, archive. And at the end, more practical, practically, it, it translates into the ability to do telemetry, to instrument things, to collect data, to transport and store effectively all this information, and um, yeah, make it work at the, the scale that the, the, say our user needs. Uh, looking a bit at the challenges we are facing, uh, one is the rate and the volume. Uh, <coughs> gathering, let's say, already metrics and logs from data center, um, let's say, host uh, infrastructure like networking or electrical equipment, uh, uh, plus all the IT services and uh, logs is around like three terabytes of data per day, in a compressed format, gives around around 100 kilohertz. That, that's more or less the, the volume of the data that we, have, we, are, we are dealing with. Uh, another challenge is about the variety of the different use cases, uh, because if we focus okay, on, on, on name, namely host, host metrics or something that we know about, that's fairly easy, but we also know that our users are fairly different. They have very different uh, needs, very different data format, very different expectation, what they want to, what they want to, to, to send to us and how they want to access it. And um, yeah, and now of course we have the, the challenge of reliability because monitoring, we all, everybody knows that monitoring need, needs to, to work when everything else is broken. So that is when uh, we have to be able to 
mm, build a system that is uh, resistant and uh, reliable, um, say, delivering uh, functionality. Uh, then we have also some non neglectable non technical challenges let's say it's pretty normal that in a in a company with decades of history we have very very custom tool uh, we started from a phase that we had basically custom tool for telemetry custom tool for dashboarding and um, uh, it, it took quite some uh, effort and time and um, to convince people and to build service manager into doing things differently um, to some extent, we also have the other problem. We have like uh, we have to stay up to date with upstream tools and trends. Otherwise, people are much eager to start and try new technology. They will uh, do their own thing, and that is actually not good for uh, the organization uh, overall. Uh, and then we also had to build community. We wanted to build a community because we have to do all these with quite a limited manpower. So we want to be able to get the most out of the community, internal and external. Um, so how to pro provide a better monitoring? Around 2016, we started a new project um, to basically change these with the idea to provide something that was uh, effective, ex effective, so it was able to deliver all the different uh, service needed the way it was expected. It was able to scale because we knew that uh, the working condition in 2016 were probably factor five or six smaller than what, we, what I just show you in terms of rate and volume. And actually something that was sustainable because we want to be able to uh, like have attract people with competencies from the outside uh, we don't want to say, do our own thing and um, looking a bit on how things look like in practice um, for what concerns the data um, collection and integration we are using collect d that is a lightweight basically c based daemon that is running on all the different uh, um, OS machine for OS metrics is a plugin based. That is something that is very good because it allows the different service manager to develop their own plugin for their own services if they need it, or to you or to use existing plugins. Uh, just take and contribute upstreams in case. We were um, we we provide also generic uh, HTTP gateways that can be used to send custom metrics and logs if someone has his custom workflow, and then for the more uh, say cloud native application uh, we are using Prometheus uh, to monitor and uh, to gather data for things like Kubernetes cluster and so on. Um, in in terms of um, different backends we are writing data to, uh, of course, to stay responsive we are writing to different type of uh, storage system and technology. We are using Elasticsearch for everything that is more textual and logs alike for doing uh, search and discovery. We have three clusters with around 100 terabyte of index data there. Uh, we're using FlexDB uh, for the time series information. Um, FlexDB, the open source version, so there we have to do some gymnastic for the uh, clustering of the instances. So we have like quite a number of instances. Um, writing around 60 kilohertz there on, a, on probably around several tens of millions of series, probably around 100 million, 100 million of series. And then we are writing everything to HDFS because we have also quite a number or, of more um, analytics-like workflow. So users that they want to do and do like, I want to scan my six-month CPU uh, to see trends and pattern. So at the end, we ended up with a data integration issue because we start having like, a, Okay, we knew all metrics, they go in, in FlexDB, easy. But all logs go Elasticsearch, easy. But then all data has to go to archive, okay? And then we start having, okay, some metrics, they may also go to search indexes because they contain some textual information that our user, they will be happy to search an index. Okay, then we had some logs that also can be used to extract some more metrics. So it was basically a data integration issue. And we ended up, uh, say, the standard way. We basically are using Kafka. We are injecting all these metrics and log into Kafka that I don't think it needs any in introduction in this context. And then we are basically writing this data out uh, to the different storage system as it needed. Um, this also enabled uh, quite, um, let's say, um, 
fundamental uh, functionality in the workflow, basically allow us to access the data as it, as it comes, uh, doing enrichment, transformation, or metric extraction. And that is something that we do also to provide to the user that they want to, to do. They had some, um, say, needs for uh, extracting the information, for example, from logs, from metrics, from log, etc. So on, on the pipeline approach, uh, it's something that uh, it really fits the, um, our needs, um, apart from the coupling producer and consumer, because we may not know in advance where all the different data format, uh, uh, what the data set they have to go. It enables stream processing and also give us uh, a good resiliency. Uh, the different backend system, they, they can have issue and glitches. Uh, in this way, we are basically buffering all the data for 72 hours. Uh, also, the Kafka cluster, mm, we are running it on, it on premises, of course, on the OpenStack clouds we have. We are running it on VMs with set volumes attached. We have around like 15,000 partitions there in total. Um, that's all for the, for the pipeline, pipeline part. And then uh, dashboard and visualization. Of course, we are using different tools to monitoring different, uh, the, the, the different um, depending on different backends. Kibana is the use for the for the Elasticsearch uh, front end. Um, Grafana for more dashboarding part and Jupyter for the analytics workflow. What very important aspect here is that it needs to delegate control to the user. We need to, let's say, um, empower user with the possibility to create a dashboard they need and uh, to give them access to uh, their users uh, the way they want. And that's why we end up using mainly Grafana, using mainly Grafana for the mm, dashboarding functionality. Uh, it works very well for us as yes, mm, support for multiple backends. That is something that definitely, definitely we need. And it's also fairly customizable in terms of the dashboard uh, that you can build out of it. It gives uh, all the possibility to have menus and filters and drop down template variable that you can populate dynamically from the backend. It's, it's really the tool that uh, simplifies a lot our life in doing this, uh, this job. Um, um, I will tell you, bit, basically, to give you some example here, for example, uh, this is a dashboard that is used by the network monitoring teams that uh, they are basically taking all the network metrics information that we are gathering from the host. They are enriching them on the fly uh, with um, Spark uh, job in this case uh, to do router uh, to attach to each metric the router topology. Uh, something that is, they also change quite dynamically. And then they build this dashboard that they, they use um, to do internal operation for the networking part. Um, Another example is, uh, this is more for the WCG transfer, so basically dashboard that are used 24-7 uh, by operator. I know nobody should look 24-7 statically to a dashboard, pretty aware, but let's say we have operator that there, they check the correctness of the site, uh, the transfer between the different sites in WCG. Um, uh, again, this is an example where um, there was little, uh, let's say, this type of visualization was not, let's say, available uh, the way we wanted in Grafana. So we simply contributed upstream. We developed a patch for these, and then we pushed these. And that, that's so it's a way of doing things differently and contributing to being part of the community and contributing to the community rather than, let's say, doing a thing our, our own way. And. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's another uh, example of um, basically taking, mixing multiple information and taking uh, basically extracting metrics from log with some sort of post-processing and then to provide some more uh, high-level information. Um, on alarming, we have uh, uh, quite also, uh, say, challenge uh, set up there. Uh, our users were very much uh, in need of having something local on the machine because we had the workflow um, since years where they can set up um, some sort of actuator, so basically some recovery, reco automated recovery in case of error directly on the machine. So we had to provide ways to do uh, this sort of local detection of issue and provide some sort of closed loop workflow where they can set up some, let's say, automatic, automated recipe. This we do uh, through CollegeD and the threshold plugin of CollegeD. Uh, we also notice a quite, uh, let's say, 
steady increase of the usage of uh, on dashboards, alarming like uh, the Grafana part that allows to build basically alerts, uh, aggregating data from multiple series. Mm, we also have, uh, say, few users that do, do external alarming. They all use basically um, uh, generic entry point where they can detect the is different issue and then inject these into the infrastructure. And all this is integrated with our ticketing system that is based on ServiceNow that we use for ticketing and uh, to some extent also for doing paging and to follow up basically the duties of the service management. Uh, sum up quickly, those are the monitoring technology that we are using and that we are using today to do, say, monitoring at CERN. Uh, if we look in perspective after like a couple of years working on this, it is a successful story. So today we are, um, the, the majority of our service manager, they're using these. We have more than 1,000 different dashboards. We have millions of queries per day. We also have a number of uh, Grafana organization that if you want are uh, the way Grafana allows to send box the different dashboard to the different teams and the way that it can be used to, to um, say, to, to give the user the power to do, to do what they need and to, do, to care about their uh, service operation. Uh, the next is to profit at best from all this data because, yeah, that, that's nice. Um, monitoring part, there is a lot of information, there is a, a lot of value in this information, but we, we felt we could do better, we could do better way to try to do better operation for our service and our service manager. And that is where it comes to play, the, let's say, the um, SRE and SRE practices. Uh, if we start looking at the SRE key point of interest for, uh, for the Senius case, it's particular because it's, it's becoming a common framework for production system management. Um, to some extent, it reduces operational node. That is exactly what we are aiming at because we want sustainability, we want uh, to maximize our efficiency. And also it formalizes some sort of best practices for software velocity and quality because it gives some good indication of how, how, how fast you could push your thing without breaking any, any let's say, um, the, the, the confidence and the trust and the functionality for your user. Um, the SRE practices are definitely a good fit with CERN. Um, the, the culture of openness and sharing is definitely in our DNA. Uh, we are doing blameless post-mortem, as you can see, since a while. And in this case, the poor weasel that decided to bite on a high power cable that caused a major shutdown for CERN, for, uh, electricity for a couple of hours, yeah, it ended up electrocuted, but uh, we had no fear in actually uh, say that's something that we do uh, not only at that level of incident, but regularly like uh, we have um, an open discussion on problem and issue across team, across groups. So that is something that really fits uh, our, our, our way of working. Uh, we also see that um, the concept of joint ownership, the con we are now building even more complex services that they depend on other services that are run by other service manager. And uh, one person's problem is actually another person's cause. Uh, and this way also of trying to build the same language and speak the same uh, word, it's, 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 uh, it's something we're looking for. And uh, also in terms of sustainability, it's, it's, it's really something that we are uh, looking forward to be able to attract skill from outside and be able to also give career opportunity to people coming at CERN. Uh, we have fairly high turnover, so it's something, definitely something that we are, it, it was interesting for us. So uh, we start with this idea. Okay, now that we have all these monitoring data, we are a lot of service managers that are all providing in their own private dashboard uh, metrics about they do they use for service operation. Let's try to introduce some of the SRE monitoring practices in, in, in this work uh, with the idea to build a common language, common naming, uh, and common culture. Uh, introducing, starting with introducing SLI and SLO and uh, focusing one dashboard at a time because we know that uh, the starting point to, um, for this work has to be something that has to have some visual feedback, some practical result uh, that could be, let's say, felt by the, the, the different uh, service manager. Um, so 
introducing this, uh, the strategy to introduce the SLI uh, was mainly to build a critical mass of early adopter among the main IT services um, and to work with the relevant service manager to extract uh, the data. Uh, we knew already that uh, some indicator, some what, what is today uh, SLI in the new workflow was already there because of they were doing and they were measuring things, they were already reporting things that could be used for these. And then we try to solve a real problem to help the idea spread faster. So we try to say, see how in practice having SLI could, could improve the way that we were doing things in a, in, in, with a practical outcome. And we were decided to tackle a problem of service availability that is a bit of different, uh, say, in a more open, uh, open uh, let's say, meaning of the term. Uh, if we look at, those are basically true story from our chat or Mattermost uh, snippets like people in the morning arriving and say, oh, is there a problem with service X or is, any, is anybody else having issue today or I think that the service X is not very good, is behaving weirdly. And um, all these are basically indication that uh, the way we were doing measuring availability of our service was not optimal. Um, there was already like, uh, uh, we, we have already an availability so-called matrix, so there was a common syntax for the availability that we were using. All the service manager are actually reporting service availability information uh, regularly, but the, uh, let's say, the, the correlation between that information and the actual uh, status of the services was not so good, and it would benefit for a more precise and quantitative measurement uh, of, the, of the actual status and health. So we introduced SLI, we took the SLI by the book if you want. We focus on different service manager to uh, give us an identify user facing matrix, focusing on Goldic signal, so write and read latency for storage systems, uh, the rate of successful cloud API requests uh, for open stacks, or the rate of batch, uh, batch server uh, jobs occupancy. And then we try to put all these together in uh, some sort of dashboards that can be used to uh, report how the different uh, SLI for the main IT services. Again, try to, try to um, put together few numbers for each of the major services and um, basically having this uh, single stat panel dashboard that can be used to give a quick number overview and then with the possibility to basically click to drill down and then include uh, more information for the different services that uh, a user can actually go and um, let's say explore better the, um, the status of the, of the, of the underneath uh, server. Um, the idea was to um, yeah, provide a self-describing uh, dashboard using uh, single stat panel in Grafana is a good way to do that. You can have like indication, uh, Self of the description of the panel, you can put the, the drill down a link, uh, and then you can start also introducing the concept of SLO. Basically, you can start agreeing with the service manager the way that you can define threshold, threshold that can become then uh, what you want to tell to your user if the service is working as expecting or is having some issue. Um, and then we'll start tracking SLO in uh, basically you can you start out of some, this something that we can do on our side, we are, we are actually doing, we are measuring the SLO versus the, define, the SLI versus the defined SLO. We have basically Grafana rules that can be set up to generate uh, also alarms on the SLO, and uh, those alarms are actually fed back into the system that they can be used also for trends and visualization. Um, in, um, so this not only moved from the visualization uh, of the dashboard of the SLI overview, but also you can now start having, let's say, SLO-driven operation. We have uh, basically alert on SLO bins. So we try to, we have service manager caring more about the symptoms rather than what they need to know about uh, what more on the operation. We're also tracking these into building performance trend that can be used to show way how the service evolved uh, over time, if it's doing better or uh, if you're having some issue. And at the end, what we want, what, what we actually um, achieved at the end was to have SLO driven availability. So to derive those greenness that we, we saw before in the dashboard from the SLO and SLI rather than, uh, the, uh, rather than the, the, the custom metrics. 
There are several technical challenges we encounter during the way. Um, Grafana alert engine is fine. It really relies on TSDB capabilities. For Prometheus, this is fairly advanced. If Flux default time one has some limitation, let's say Flux that sh is next generation should do a better job, but let's say we're not really into that at the moment. Um, also black box versus white box. The, do implementing all these, the white box fits usual, the usual matrix flow. For the black box, we have the feeling that we could do better job if we could provide some more uh, framework for probing. Um, about the non-technical challenges, uh, yeah, that they were challenges. We had a lot of uh, issue, basically, on a lot of issue, a lot of discussion with service manager to convince them that even it was not exactly their fault. Uh, the, the server independence is something that is not, let's say, you have to take into account when you provide the SLI and the SLO. And uh, there was also a big debate on using user-related metric as SLI. Uh, we had that's something that was very difficult to convince people to use a metric that actually depends on more on the traffic or on the utilization. That is something that still is good, and you can get value out of tracking that number, even if it's driven completely by how the user are using your service. And also some more technical challenges because of the approach that we end up uh, um, in a bottom-up way. So basically, we try first to build critical mass and then to convince that the idea is good, that to have then backed up uh, from the management to implement it on a wide scale. So um, the lesson learned, uh, dashboard first approach works. The idea to have uh, uh, easy to understand, easy to visualize with visual feedback, uh, SLI overview dashboard was definitely a win, was a good way to introduce a concept like SLI SLO. There were very good starting points to implement, let's say, some of the, to make service manager aware of some of the SRE practices and the, a different way of doing service operation and management. Um, at the end, it's a cultural change. It's, uh, it's, it's something that it, it, it requires a lot more um, interaction with people rather than the technology. So definitely target people more than technology in your work plan. Uh, so concluding, it's it, this was basically show you that uh, we are now using basically a modern open source monitoring stack and common praxi practices for doing service operation and service management. Um, the SRE framework and culture proved to be a very good direction and very good, uh, say, evolution for uh, the way we do service operation. And we are definitely just the beginning of uh, our SRE journey. Uh, we are definitely looking forward to the next steps and possibly come here in one or two years' time and uh, tell you about the actual steps that we are going to take next. And that's all. Okay, water. Question, please. I have two questions, if you'll indulge me. Um, sure. You're talking about alerting on SLO misses. Is that over a particular time period, like 30 days, or a smaller time window of 10 minutes, perhaps? Mm. This is more on a um, very short interval at the moment. It's like one hour or so. Okay, so you're setting your SLOs over a one hour yes. period, okay. Yes. Um, have you looked at using error budgets over longer period of times instead of? Not yet. Okay. Def definitely in the next steps. Yeah, excellent. Um, my second question is, uh, I assume that some of the pushback about using user-facing metrics instead of uh, system metrics for SLIs is because people are now worried about losing visibility into the causes of problems rather than the symptoms. Did you do any, is that true? And if so, did you do any uh, investment in tooling to help people improve their debuggability now that you've removed some of that uh, visibility at the monitoring level? No, not yet. Okay. So it much depends on the different services to be good in instrumenting and adding telemetry where it needed, but we are, don't do anything special there. So yeah, it's up to them to give us the good data and to use and to use that data the best. That's it. All right. Thank you very much. Cheers.
Um, just a question around uh, the SLIs and developing those. Are they all related just to, say, a pure single metric, or do can you, you... Can you... Sorry. Uh, just running around the SLIs, are they a pure single like metric from, a, say, a log um, source, or have you got any aggregate SLIs? Uh, yeah, so the SLI normally uh, are, um, I think the overview visualization are aggregated also across dimension that can be like um, mm. the multiple instance of the service that I'm monitoring. And we are trying to be uh, relevant there is that if you have an issue with one of the many services that instances that are beyond your server, your SLI is to be representative and to go down. So in the drill down view, the SLI actually is exploded and then you can see the different detailed trend for each of them. But there is aggregation. The way that it is aggregated, it much depends on the service manager at the end. But the way we see normally we take it, uh, the, the worst of the indicators that is reported, that are reported for the different uh, monitoring things. Let's say. Uh, so, so I have multiple questions here. So the first one was uh, when you spoke about Grafana, yep. okay, Grafana monitors. So the, those widgets that we show, I mean the logs that we you know see in a graphical thing, those come from InfluxDB or from uh, or from the log from Kibana. Uh, Kibana. Wait, uh, can you repeat what what comes? Yeah, uh, I mean the Grafana widgets, right? The, the Grafana graphs that you see, yeah. the data come from InfluxDB or from the or from the directly from the sources. The so Grafana Influx, Influx is used to, just to store data? We, the, those Grafana plots yeah, are yeah. made from InfluxDB data sources in Grafana. So they're reading data out from InfluxDB, and then we are using the InfluxDB query language to say okay. query the data that we know. Right. So, so in that case, uh, when you say InfluxDB, and you said uh, you had multiple instances of InfluxDBs, right? Sure. So the whole Grafana, the whole monitoring is based on the InfluxDBs? Uh, say. The, the, most of those plots that are time series are taking data from InfluxDB. Okay. And okay, some also from Elasticsearch, but those are the two main sources that we have. Right. So, so do we have any? Some. The data collection is Prometheus. Is that right? We also have some Prometheus data source. Okay. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So my question was, you know, so the most Important thing is the, uh, the the influx DB where the data is resides, and we we pull those data into Grafana. So do we have monitoring for influx as well? Yes, sure, indeed. But influx, as uh, let's say, he had some telemetry built in that you can use uh, to explore the metrics. Okay. Um, but yeah, with it, it's part of the same flow. If you want, we also have. Uh, monitoring of all the other tools that we use for doing monitoring that of course it goes to a not to the same path but that is to some sort of high, high availability let's say secondary path that is some sort of replica of the same pipeline just not to use the same thing to monitoring itself right it helps cheers hi uh, thank you for the presentation i have two questions basically so imagine I, I saw that in your presentation you have multiple data centers span across the world. So um, how do you deal with uh, querying the data? How do you deal with the latency of querying all those data? And the uh, follow-up question is, uh, do you compress the data and basically just uh, send all the important data to a centralized location? Thanks. So <clears throat> the we don't actually have many data centers around the world. Those are, um, let's say, that is more the distributed infrastructure that is used for computing. We have the data center, the main data center is in one location, that is uh, Meran in France, in uh, Switzerland. And then we have some sort of uh, secondary site in Budapest, in Hungary. Uh, there, for the latency matters, because we have like our open stack is actually spread across two different uh, locations. We have three, 100 gigabit link uh, connection that has been set up. So we, we handle latency at that level from these two data center. But then more on the data that we, uh, 
we gather, yes, we do, we do put all these data together in like in our pipeline, that data is compressed, uh, let's say it's Kafka taking care of the compression of the data, and then of course is uh, decompressed depending on the different storage system that we write into. Okay. So would you say that the latency is some kind of ignorable in your case? So yeah, yeah, we don't, we don't we're not okay. real like, time. There like, are no uh, like uh, multiple DC across like Asia? No, 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 we're not in that case, yeah. Okay. One last question. Can I? Right. Hi, uh, Hello. I have a question on how do you deal with monitoring noise? And uh, the second part of the question is in a situation okay, where you have to find a needle from haystack, how you manage that? Uh, can you repeat the second part, please? Uh, in a situation where you have to find a needle from a haystack, how do you manage that? I would say that, okay. It's not really up to me, <laughs> in some extent. I, we are mainly, um, so the good thing is, for, for us, a, go a good way to improve things in that direction was to have the possibility to user to in access the data as it flies and to enrich it with more information, like to extract or to format or to, so that, that is something that improved the noise to information range. Um, but yeah, again, it depends a lot on the different services that are doing the monitoring to to have a good instrumentation, to have a good, uh, uh, say, tracking of the different things. So it, right. it, it, it depends. I, I, there, there is no, let's say, solution that comes from the infrastructure for that. Is, is there any automated solutions, you know, where, you know, you do analytics and then, you know, you reduce the noise or, you know, you discard the noise from the... Uh, metrics or data coming in? Not that I, n not in what I show today, I say, not in our infrastructure. Okay, thank you.